Nova ones are ready to ship. K Bar has an ad band, and I'll show you 10 snob proof knives that won't break the bank. I'm Bob DeMarco. This is the Knife Junkie Podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go around. My favorite comment from this past week was from Taylor Fishman823, uh, and he was talking about th my video on the new Pioneer Jack from Jack Wolf Knives. He says, as a big fan of Sodbusters, I'm glad to see he did one. Ultim Covers is a new look for a traditional knife, though it ain't for me personally. Will be interesting to see what other flavors it comes in. Then again, I can't afford it anyway. LOL. Reminds me of Ohio. You have the heart of a poet. Well, of course, I like hearing I have the heart of a poet. I said that the Ultim next to the gray looks like the, uh, the fields in Ohio when you drive in. Whenever I drive home, no matter how beautiful it is elsewhere on the drive, it's always gray when I get to Ohio. Beautiful afterward, but uh, it, it's always my first impression. So yes, the heart of a poet indeed. But also interesting to see where we're going to go with Ultim. Um, I I like the material. Like I said, I do like the color. Um, and it's, it's a very, very uh, high impact plastic. So it can take a lot of heat and a lot of physical. Uh, uh, so it's like a tough thing. It's, it's got a, a high toughness for plastic. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, do people like the look? I don't know. It depends. Uh, I think it's a taste issue. So we have a lot of very strong plastics that can be used for knife, uh, knife handles out there. So if Ultima is not your thing, worry not. Uh, the trend will continue, but uh, so will all the other handle materials. Okay, that being said, let's get to a pocket check. So in my front right pocket today, I had the venerable VSEP from Les George Knives. This was the knife. I've been carrying this a little bit more than usual recently, uh, just because I think it's just great. And uh, I've had my eye on Les George. Uh, he, he's been working on a Talos, sort of a, uh, a, a um, what do you want to call it? Uh, a mid-tech version of the Talos. So something sort of like this, but in the Talos form. And I'm very excited about that. So I've been carrying this quite a bit. Such a good knife. This is a great all-arounder. All I always talk about how when it first came out, people were saying, oh, it's the Sabenza killer. And though it didn't kill or displace the Sabenza, it just added another like really tremendous knife to a group of snob proof knives uh, out there on the higher end. Now, you're, this is going to be a recurring theme throughout this podcast. This happens to be a snob proof knife. Uh, no one out there, even if it's not their, uh, even if it's not their cup of tea, there's no one out there who can say that that's a bad knife or, or who can uh, look down their nose at it at a cocktail party. All right. Next up uh, is the knife we were just talking about, the Pioneer Jack from Jack Wolf Knives, a beautiful Sodbuster interpretation. Sodbuster is actually the case um uh name uh what do you call it uh the official name from case a trademark name from case but uh you'll see bullnose or american farmer work knife or lots of different uh names for this style but it's a straight back knife with a long straight edge and a belly at the end and a nice curved handle just to give you great great grip now here ben belkin as he does modernize the design put some facets on the end, made it a little more angular, but it's still retaining the overall uh, swoop down here where the fingers go and straight um, straight back where the palm goes. Great work knife and for Jack Wolf knives, a more robust grind. Uh, he's been using, Ben Belkin has been using the full, full hollow grind on almost all of his knives, a few exceptions like, uh, uh, like the Lanny's clip. Um, but this one here, it does have the full height hollow grind, but it has a long swedge across the top, which also makes uh, just gripping and ripping it a little bit difficult. I, I end up using that nail neck quite a bit. But also the grind itself seems a little bit thicker 
to maybe to accommodate harder work you might be putting this knife through just due to its um, uh, raison d'etre. Okay, uh, next up is the uh, knife I had, on, the fixed blade I had on me in index or uh, appendix right here, <laughs> index, in appendix. Uh, I've been carrying on the belt and appendix quite a bit, but up front, because that's where your hands naturally go. And and uh, I'm not wearing so much on the on the three o'clock side anymore. Uh, but anyway, this is the pocket rocket, a beautiful three inch dagger from um, Michael Jarvis and auxiliary manufacturing out of Reno, Nevada, a former chef turned knife maker. He makes some really, really exquisite stuff. His his uh, sort of EDC stuff uh, that I would consider this among his EDC knives um, are really, really uh, well made, really beautifully made all by hand um, in terms of the grinds and such. And these beautifully faceted handles, uh, especially on this dagger, any way you turn it, uh, sometimes people like to use daggers in this sort of shovel grip. Uh, other times you have that more standard grip. Doesn't matter which way you turn this knife you have a lot of great options for uh, where to put your fingers. So this, this uh, octagonal and sort of angular looking handle is actually quite comfortable. Uh, thanks be to God, I did not have to use that today because that's just a self-defense sort of knife. Or if you use it as a work knife, it gives you two, two edges. I mean, I'm not saying a dagger has to be self-defense. Uh, it could be a, a supremely efficient work knife because you get two two edges. You just have to be careful um, with your EDC tasks. Okay, and for um, emotional support, my ESK today was the really cool, but totally not my thing, but I love it, <laughs> Shielden uh, Gambit. This is a Dirk Pinkerton design. And so, yeah, no, I, I bought this knife because I was buying some other knives from him and he said, oh, I have this one, too. And I said, you know, throw it in there. And, and then when I saw what it was, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not so much into cleavers. And then I got it. And I was like, oh, this one, uh, this one has sort of a straight razor, a cartoonish straight razor profile to it. It's got those five speed holes that you can use for for opening. Uh, it's very sharp, 154 cm, uh, flat grind that gets super thin behind the edge. It's a very, very useful knife. Uh, you know, book by its cover and all that. Uh, I tend to do that, especially with knives, uh, more so than anything else. Uh, but this, uh, I'm glad I told him to drop it in my cart because um, it's a different and it's nice to be uh, sort of drawn out of your wheelhouse from time to time. So it's different for me, but also it just happens to be an excellent EDC and fun to play with. I'll be honest. It's a very sharp toy for me. All right, there you go. This is what I had on me today. Uh, the Les George VSEP. Uh, I think this is the second run. People have corrected me. It, it came originally with the spoon clip, so that's not the original clip. So I think this is a, a very old one. Uh, the Great Eastern, uh, or the GE, oh man. Jack Wolf Knives, Pioneer Jack, the Pocket Rocket from Auxiliary Manufacturing, and the Shield and Knives Gambit. Sorry for the uh, for the senior moment there, but this is what I had on me. You let me know what you had on you. Always uh, always nice to get some ideas that way and find out what to, what you classy folks are carrying. Okay, speaking of class, uh, I just wanted to let you all know the Nova Ones are. Uh, shipping this week who knows by the time you're hearing this they may have shipped already i did a lot this past weekend it was really great pulling all the nova ones out inspecting each one not that i was inspecting it for quality they're custom knives i knew they were going to come from matt chase in ideal form but it was great to pour over each one get them ready uh, i laid out a, a a tape grid on my bar downstairs, got everything, because some people ordered specific numbers. You you will get your specific number if that's what you want, if that's what you ordered. Uh, and these are going to go out. Now, uh, since this pre-order has been done, there's been a lot more interest in the knife. So what we're, we're going to do another um, run. We're going to do the uh, the Nova 2 at some time in the future, which will have a Warncliffe blade. I'm going to say that now, now that these are done. Uh, it's a really cool design, and 
it will have a different handle material and but it will it will be the same but different so there will be more opportunities to get these and who knows uh these were so popular at blade show that uh, because matt brought a, a prototype so popular at blade show we might make it part of his you know we might work something out where it's part of his uh, regular offerings but anyway i just wanted to show off a production uh final production knife versus my prototype here so here's my proto type this has gotten a lot of carry over the past uh well almost a year and here is the uh production model so where this had the jimping uh further back and the red liners this one has the jimping further up frankly, where it's in a much more useful place. And it's one inch of really nice jimping there. And then you've got green liners, like a British racing green. And 154 CM, deep hollow grind, super sharp. My God, he got incredible edges on this. And then, of course, you can see the logo. The Knife Junkie logo is shrunk down there. And there is the um, serial number, 27 of 27. So I am thrilled as uh, as can be with these just in incredible knives. Uh, and the sheaths, of course, are awesome. And they're all shipping with the discrete carry concepts. Uh, three quarter inch clip. Great for um, just under the belt on the waistline. Perfect. I mean, you could wear this in your gym shorts. All right. Well. That is uh, very exciting to me, and there is more exciting knife news in terms of my designs uh, happening out there, but I can't really talk about one of them right now, and I like saying that. can't really tell you about this one, but there's exciting stuff happening, and I'm, I'm happy to be turning some of my taste, some of my artistic talent, and some of my love of knives into actual things. Now, now this actual thing, this Nova One, was a true collaboration in that, uh, you know, it was a volley back and forth with a design based on someone else's design. And it was it was great to do. It's very rewarding. I can't wait for people to have these in their belts. Okay, still to come, uh, we're gonna take a look at Knife Life News. One of the things there I mentioned up front, uh, K-Bar has a band ad, uh, which is nuts, you'll see. And then uh, we're gonna get to some snob-proof knives that won't break the bank. And as we get there, I'll show you some classics that, uh, you know, if money's no object. All right, coming up on the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife. And we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit the knifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Well, uh, Lucas Burnley and Boker Knives go together like horse and carriage. And here's another one from those two, a new collaboration on an older design. Older meaning uh, it's been around a little while anyway. And that's the Burnley Kihan. The Kihan first came out as a, um, a flipper, um, not as a flipper, I'm sorry, as an automatic with a, with a very interesting blade. Uh, they've, they've changed it. And, uh, well, they are offering a, a down market version of it, I should say now, with a less interesting drop point blade and uh, GFN handle scales. Uh, so it's something that can be a little more readily available to all. Uh, it's the Keon DC. Uh, so it's an auto that goes manual. This is budget oriented at 50 bucks. Uh, it's drop point D2. Uh, that's a GFN handle crossbar lock. That's the main... Uh, that's the main G uh, USP here is that crossbar lock. Uh, it says on the German website, uh, Boker Plus German website, it'll be available on Octo October 6th. Uh, if this is your thing, uh, I, I got to say the, the original Kihan uh, by comparison is a, is a, is a much more unique and handsome knife. So uh, this is a, a, a nice way to go to get it in your pocket and to get your hands on a crossbar lock by Boker. Uh, but if you like this one, check out the original Keon. 
you might you might like it even more. All right, next up is from Benchmade, and we saw this one in that liner from Knives Ship Free. It's a fancy new mini Adamus. Uh, the Adamus designed by Shane Sibbert, uh, whose work, if you don't follow him on Instagram, do yourself a favor, Shane Sibbert, S-I-B-E-R-T. He's a custom knife maker who makes just exquisite fixed and folding knives. Uh, but this uh, Benchmade Mini Adamus the, it has been a huge hit in the black class of Benchmade, probably their most selling black class knife. And here it's getting the fancy pants uh, treatment. Look at that profile. That is beautiful and definitely very signature Shane Sibbert. As you can see from this picture, it's got a marbled carbon fiber handle, which uh, on these production runs are much more sumptuous and interesting to look at, complicated to the eye, than the original carbon fiber that they were talking about when they first released the concept. So they've, they've upped their game with the carbon fiber. It is contoured, as you can see. And then the hardware, that's the pivot collar, the thumb studs and the pocket clip are anodized bronze and the s that that was originally going to be a cpm crew wear blade but they have decided to go with the cpm magna cut blade for production so that's uh exciting and uh oh uh, the D the liners of this are dark flat earth and to me that's cool now i called the the hardware bronze i could be wrong it could all be flat dark earth but from this picture it does look bronzed. Uh, this is available now, and uh, it'll cost you a pretty penny, but, you know, that's that's Benchmade. This one, I would probably say, though, is worth it because, man, look at that knife. It's beautiful. And, you know, some companies or most companies spend more time and attention and resources on certain knives. And I would venture to say that this would be that for Benchmade. Okay, next up, K-Bar appearing twice in Knife Life News today, first with a historic knife project uh, re-release, which these things are so cool when they do that. They did this with the Red Spacer K-Bar a while back. Well, this one is called the EW Stone Knife, and this is a reproduction of a very famous theater knife from World War II. Theater knives were uh, knives that were... Um, made in theater. Uh, so they would take blades, K-bar blades, or you know, uh, knives that had otherwise broken perhaps, um, or just knives that they wanted to customize and make new handles for them. Um, a Navy machinist called E.W. Stone, um, Eugene William Stone, uh, was famous for making uh, a bunch of these. He made about 300, I think, or he... Yeah, he was known for making uh, hundreds of these knives uh, in aluminum, and he would cast them, and they have, uh, so he would take the K-bar blades and cast these handles on the, onto the blades with um, a cobra sort of pattern in the handle, and then a skull at the bottom. He made a bunch of different variations you can see online with knuckle dusters and all sorts of different um different styles of hilt for the K-Bar, mostly uh, in Australia and in Java and the um, Pacific theater, because those leather stacked handles did not fare well in that super humid sort of uh, uh, jungle heat. So you take cast aluminum and make the handle out of that. And uh, that blade is not going, that knife isn't going anywhere. Look at that thing. That is super cool. I love all the finger grooves. I, it looks like it feels really comfortable in hand. The only thing I say is you're out there in the hot, 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 you know, de um, jungle. Is that aluminum going to get hot to the touch? I guess if you're concerned about that, uh, everything else is going pretty well. Anyway, uh, really looking forward to these. Uh, they are available now, but you better jump on it pretty quickly because um, I'm sure they'll go fast, especially with um, collectors. Uh, an interesting little note about this is these are made, these hilts that that uh, are of aluminum with this pattern that K-Bar is putting on this knife project are made by the son of the original maker, uh, by E.W. Stone, using the original die uh, in which uh, this aluminum was cast. So very, very cool. I'm sure they're going to be uh, um, flying off the shelves. I'd love to have something like that. All right, last up, speaking of... Um, speaking of... K bar is this commercial. They were okay. They were asked by a streaming service to 
to advertise on the streaming service. Here, this is directly from Kbar. Quote, we were recently contacted by a large streaming service asking us to advertise. When it came to finalize, we were informed we were not allowed to advertise as we are a quote unquote weapons company. This is the ad in question. What do you think? And uh, we're going to show it here in a second, but I just, I think that this is pretty, pretty remarkable. And you'll see why. Uh, I, I think that this couldn't be, there couldn't be a friendlier, more uh, accessible way to reach out to a non knife crowd to advertise. But for, for some reason, this was pulled. Now, maybe one of the marketing geniuses at this streaming service decided to look up K Bar and then saw, you know, that K Bar has a long history of military use, outdoor use, uh, even has been in the news for some grisly crimes. Uh, so they decided, well, you're a weapons company and uh, pulled it. So, anyway, uh, let's see if we can pull up this ad um, and show it here. Got a delivery guy dropping off a package. Dude comes out, American flag waving on his porch. He cannot get into the box. He's going mad. Even his wife's crying now. Punching it, throwing it, kicking it. Ah, a K-Bar. And all it is is a very small K-Bar dozier in, in cheerful bright orange that zips the bag open. And you see the knife for an instant you see it for about 15 frames half a second or something like that uh and this is what got the streaming service clutching their pearls oh my goodness we cannot be associated with such a stalwart american brand that helps save this nation uh, can't do that and so they uh they leave them dangle i think it's a disgrace uh what do you think let me know in the comments all right coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at snob-proof knives that won't break the bank. And before we get there, we'll show the ones that probably will break the bank, but uh, are, 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 are the foundation upon which all else rests, right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Coming up in the knife hobby online, we've always uh, often heard about the royal triumvirate or the or the or the the big three, and uh, these are folding knives that everyone must have in their collection, you know, before they die. And it's the Hinderer XM18 right here, and uh, there are a couple of others. We'll show those in a second. I I'm I'm holding up five that are really sort of emblematic and you can wear carry these into any crowd of knife snobs and no one can say a damn thing. Uh, so the first one is the XM18. Of course, this one here is a, uh, a special edition DLT trading, no choil uh, version uh, with the triway pivot. So this has bearings. Uh, this is my only uh, of my four xms hinderer xms is the only one with bearings it is nice it is luxurious it's great action uh but with that painful flipper tab i don't know the detent and everything I, i'm just happy with my my old one uh this is a first sort of one of the first runs of the of the triway so who knows maybe maybe it's gotten better for me okay so the first one xm18 totally totally og snob proof knife uh i'm gonna pepper in a couple of couple of new kids on the block and by that i mean it's not that new at this point but it's the spartan harzy folder uh this is another one that you just no one can say anything if you have this in your pocket except hey man massive respect for your spartan harzy folder uh this is a knife that combines the the hydraulic action feel and and the stout slabbiness of the ex or of the sabenza with some of the panache and strength of the hinderer xm series with i'm looking especially at those giant um standoffs and puts them together into a knife that is a classic american folder it seems like it's been around forever like the sabenza but it really hasn't um and it's and it boasts that bill harsey design and bill harsey's designs can be seen across 
luxury brands like Spartan uh, to budget brands like Gerber. I mean, he's designed for everybody and they all have an emblematic look. They all have a style and you can pick them out, whether it's a dagger or a folder or a fixed blade, you can pick out a Harzi fold, uh, a Harzi knife a mile away. So um, nothing you can say about a Harzi, whether it's the, the Spartan Harzi folder, whether the fact that it's made in America, these are all made in America too. That's a, that is a, an issue here. Uh, it's strength, it's durable, durability, it's looks. And then of course it's pedigree with Spartan blades and Bill Harzi. Okay. Next up is the Strider series. Now I have the SMF. I've always had the SMF. SNG is just like this, but smaller. So I would easily, you know, swap those out if that's more your uh, size. But this knife is has been around long enough. It's like uh, it's like the line from Chinatown. Um, Politicians, ugly buildings and whores all become respectable if they stick around long enough. And that's kind of what the strider is to me it's it's kind of an awkward design uh if you're if you're seated back here you're an inch and a half away from the edge uh you know it it has a lot of weirdness to it it's a kind of an odd design feels much better when you're choked up than when you're back here um this always bites into the palm it is good in reverse grip but i don't know there, there's a lot to this knife that um doesn't quite make sense to me but it is still a great knife. It's super sturdy, and it's got a lot of originality to it with this integral backspacer slash show side piece and then the um, titanium lock side slab. This is a CC version, concealed carry, so it's it's uh, contoured. This is the most carryable uh, of the of the striders. The gunner grip has a lot of texture. That's going to tear up your pants. And the Lego is like a big block. It's like a Lego handle. Like, so it's about as comfortable as a Lego. You know, we've all stepped on them in the dark. Um, weird knife, but you can't say anything about it. So next up, similar. And this is, a, again, a new school, more new school, kind of like this uh, Spartan Harzi folder. And that is the Shark Lock Warren. AD20. This is a machine ground version uh, from Andrew Demko or Demko Knives. And uh, you've got <laughs> you've got an amazing robust build. You've got the pedigree of Andrew Demko. Let's say that Andrew Demko and his brother John uh, working in Wampum, PA, in the heart heart of America. Uh, and I don't mean to say it like that sarcastically, but it sounded weird for me to say in the heart of America. Uh, but it is true, and they're they're two uh, American brothers living the dream, making these knives, and you know they've done all this work with cold steel, and now they're out on their own, and uh, they've been just burning it up. And when I say now they're out on their own, they've always been out on their own in the custom side, but now they're producing so many knives on the production side too, with the AD twenty point five, and uh, and and the like. But also, it's the innovativeness. It's the innovation of Andrew Demko. Um, you know, he's he's created five different locks, and uh, they're all beloved uh, to to one extent or another. But this Shark Lock really takes the cake. And the cool thing about that, uh, about the Shark Lock, and about Demko knives, is they have now licensed out the Shark Lock to Flytanium. So uh, a company way outside of Demko knives is now using their lock. And to great effect from what I hear. So uh, cool people making incredible work and innovating, not just uh, riffing on what's already been done. So Demco knives, anything from them, but especially I'd say the 8020. Um, just can't say anything about it. Totally, totally snob proof. Now, uh, you're looking at this collection uh, uh, right here and saying these are all hard use tactical. And yes, that is my wheelhouse. There are plenty that would fit in this. Uh, classic and and new classic that are more gentlemanly. You know, I'm thinking about maybe the 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 um, the uh, the American Blade Works Model Two or the um, or the tactile knives, you know, bear or something like that. A modern knife, smaller, 
that's just not my wheelhouse. So there, it, I'm not saying these are the only ones. Okay, next up is, and last in this little list here, is, of course, the Sabenza from Chris Reeve Knives. Sabenza, in this case, 21. Um, a classic design. You could wear this. You could put this in your pocket with a suit. It's so classy. But when you get one in hand, you just really feel how strong it is. Uh, Chris Reeve was a, before he became a knife maker and like a preeminent knife maker and owner of a company, he was a motorcycle racer, a South African dude, motorcycle racing and just being a, a general man's man. And he intended his knives to be hard working tools. And they are, they're expensive and they're fancy and they're beautiful and they're very polished. And you can get them in crazy, uh, inlays and stuff, but at the heart and at the base of these are really hardworking, incredibly robust knives. You, you get this in hand and you know it is business. Okay, so here are my examples of five kind of cost is no issue um, snob proof knives. You would also see plenty of others on this list, but for, for what I own, I would I would say these are five of the premiums. All right, so now let's get to some that if you don't have uh, the budget at the moment to get a $500 knife um, or if you're just responsible. And, you know, some of these, I must be honest, were purchased irresponsibly. Actually, not really much on the table at this point. I've, I think I may have sold all much of that stuff off. But, hey, uh, we all have moments of weakness. So um, here are some that if you want to not go into hock in that moment of weakness that you can carry. And no one's going to say a damn thing except, oh, nice. I have one of those. First up is a rat. This one is the rat two. You could, it could be the rat one, the rat two, the Ontario rat series of knives uh, is at this point so classic and so well-respected as a great, great, great pocket knife with excellent ergonomics, incredibly smooth washer action this is some of my favorite action in any of my folders right here in the uh in the rat too uh i also own a rat one also in os8 like this uh it lives in my get home bag which is in my car so a knife i would trust uh, a folder i would trust with my life for sure um this knife is a really excellent utility folder you've got a full height flat grind, uh, ground blade, which is excellent for slicing. And you have an area up here to move up into uh, to, to choke up if you need to. This knife is so small, you wouldn't need to probably, but it's bigger brother, perhaps. And it's FRN, and it's inexpensive. And these days, you get it in D2. Uh, I don't know if they do the OS8 anymore, but um, I love this pink color. This is uh, was a gift from my daughter, before my other daughter was born, she wanted to get me a pink knife. I pointed my wife in this direction. And uh, this was a back pocket knife on the daily for a long time. And with that little noose fob uh, and the pink and the black, uh, call, call this knife Pinky Tuscadero. So you can't go wrong with a rat too. Next up, this is a newish one. And... Uh, I really like this and everyone else really likes this so much so that they have come out with multiple versions of this in the short period of time it's been extant. And that is the <clears throat> Nightshade by Vosteed. It's got this very interesting profile, which I immediately likened to a barong, uh, but I was corrected multiple times and then also watching other people's videos. Uh, this is based on a shillin cutter which is uh, no doubt a, a sort of anglicized or Germanicized word for a, chi a Chinese folder of the same shape. A Chinese folder usually has a bolster and, and uh, buffalo horn handles and uh, isn't a flipper, <laughs> uh, but has a great downward uh, leaf-shaped blade that is excellent for all sorts of utility because you have this downward uh, edge here capturing the material in the triangle that's formed when you're when you're pull cutting or you know say you're cutting rope or something pulling this way all that material gets trapped in there so it's a great great cutting knife just in its in its odd shape i'm i'm a big fan of 
knives and swords that have that downward uh, uh, edge just because they cut so nicely. And if for self-defense, your natural inclination, which it probably is, is to slash. Uh, slashing is not as effective as thrusting, but people are more prone to slash, at least with a downward angled blade like this or a kukri or something like that, you get a really, really deep slash out of it. So uh, yes, great for utility, also great for self-defense. Uh, I don't hear people talk about this knife much for self-defense, so I'll I'll be the one uh, because it is such a great utility knife, and that is how we use our knives generally or mostly. Uh, but another benefit to that downward angle, not just on the slash, but on the thrust, because you're not really changing the angle of your wrist to get the point where it needs to be. You don't have to point it down. So, um, but why snob proof, Bob? Uh, well, because A, everybody seems to like it. B, it is an excellent utility tool. But C, it's made by Vostid. And Vostid has great style, great fit and finish, and uh, really excellent action. So you look at it, it's beautiful. Uh, this G10 is nicely contoured. You can get it in uh, micarta or uh, if that's more your, your style and uh and style it is unique it's different and people like the same but different the same being folding liner lock flipper with with awesome materials this being 14 c 28 n sorry 154 cm and uh but also different you, know, you pull it out it's a conversation starter i've never seen a knife like that oh it's based on the chinese shilling cutter there goes the conversation Okay, uh, next up, this is one of the more expensive ones in this list, uh, but it is still sub $200. Now, I'm topping this off around there because I wanted to add this to the, to the list. <clears throat> this is the American Blade Works Model 1. Uh, the Model 1 is uh, a very well-researched um, knife. It was, uh, I don't want to say, um, it had a lot of input. That's what I'm trying to say. So Michael Martin of American Blade Works started making knives in his garage, started sending the products of his uh, effort around to reviewers who were looking at them and giving their assessments. He changed it, kept changing it, kept changing it until he came up with version, version six. This is a version five, incidentally. And the version six is... Uh, the absolutely dialed in version of this design here. And now why do I say it's snob proof? It's snob proof because uh, as a tool, it is excellent. It's, it's really well designed. It's not flashy. Uh, it's very ergonomic. It's good looking. Oh, I, I should say it's handsome, but not flashy. Fits the hand great, has great flipper action, strong lockup, contoured scales, uh, but it's all made by one guy, one man in his uh, in, in North Carolina, in his shop, on his property, making these. And, and he really started from nothing. I mean, what I mean is he's, he's a machinist uh, in his everyday work job and uh, started just decided to make knives. And here he's got a thriving company now, uh, still a one man band, uh, pumping out these incredible work knives. So they're American made, inexpensive, you know, because some of these other American made knives I was talking about, these things are expensive. You want to get a Strider, get ready to spend 600 bucks. I didn't spend that on this incidentally, uh, but you got to spend a lot of money. You want to get an American made handmade knife. That is an amazing tool, arguably better than some of the other ones I was showing you for $200 or less American blade works. So th there's a lot of brag here. There's a lot of bragging here in these micro micro brands uh, i'll say it uh, i'll say it like that here's another one um and maybe not micro but it's a a small uh, knife company compared to some of the big guys but it's american and it's family and it's trm three rivers manufacturing again now this one uh is the the the, the problem with this one is that it's difficult to get but when they're available, they won't break the bank. They're, these are also sub $200, or maybe they're hovering right at about 200 at this point. Um, but they are inexpensive, made in the United States, superior design, 
superior design and an, an incredible 20 CV blade uh, with a low slung tip uh, below center line. So you get a lot of utility out of it, a, a very nice straight with a, with a gentle belly there. Uh, just utility all day long in this very thin knife. It's very thin, very stylish though. Uh, so thin with the titanium liners and the USP of this, the unique selling proposition of this knife uh, and many of the, I would say the thing that put TRM on the map, Three Rivers Manufacturing out of Massachusetts on the map is the fact that to change the scales, which you can get many of them readily from them, all you have to do is pop out these two screws. Boop, boop. You don't have to disassemble the whole knife. You don't have to take off the pivot. You just take those two screws uh, uh, out. The scale pops off. Same thing over here. You have to take out three screws because of that pocket clip. And you can change the scales in under five minutes on these things. So incidentally, or coincidentally, I'm using that word too much. So I happen to have a whole bunch of scales now uh, from TRM. I can change them out with my mood. Uh, these happen to be my favorites. Um, well, currently anyway, uh, it's that milled wing design that they do in there with. Um, uh, what is that? My card called. I'm having brain farts all day, guys. Uh, yeah, with that, my carta burlap, my carta. Um, so no one is ever going to say anything to you about this. American made, small brand, easy on the pocketbook if you can get it. Um, way, many ways to customize it to your own taste. You can even get titanium scales for this um, from time to time. I don't think those are on current or on uh, indefinite offer. I think they bring them out and then let you know. So I love this TRM, Adam, and and it is a 100% snob-proof knife. Now, coming back down to earth in terms of price, if if that's on the high end, 200, this is kind of down on the low lower end of things. I got this for 60 bucks on Amazon, and it's the Large Pyrite by CJRB. Uh, you could go with any pyrite, large or small. They even have some um, prestige models right now with contoured titanium and gorgeous inlays and all sorts of micro milling. Um, uh, you can get the small versions in both um, Warncliffe blade or this beautiful drop point. Uh, both of the blades on these, you don't hear me say beautiful drop point often, but this one is. The Pyrite was sent to me originally by CJRB to check out. I loved it so much. And um, I ended up giving it away to a friend, uh, knowing that I wanted this large one and uh, wouldn't need the small one. Uh, she carries it in her in her purse, uh, likes the knife a lot, and uh, I ended up getting this one with the beautiful green blue micarta. I love that color of micarta, and they use very nice quality material there. Um, AR RPM nine proprietary powdered steel, very high flat grind, super slicey. So this is a great tool knife, but also a great fidget knife. Uh, it has, I think, what I consider the best button lock I've experienced, uh, whether it's Kaiser, Civivi, Sencut, or um, anyone else I've experienced a button lock from. And I'll tell you why. I think it, it has to do with how they mill out the pocket there. Let's, let's let that focus. So you can see on the tang of the blade, there is a cutout that is very precise. It has 90 degree uh, walls and is totally flat. You see that right there? That is where the plunger, plunge lock pops in when this opens up. And so that plunge lock there is fitting perfectly into that milled out slot, that cylindrical milled out slot. And that's why this gives you such great action and such a great pop. The way most companies do it is instead of a a socket that's cut out precisely with 90 degree walls, they cut out a cone shaped um, void. And that plunger, the idea being that plunge lock will fit ever, ever more tightly into it as everything wears down, um, it will push further into that cone shape. But I think that's where people are getting lock failures. Uh, if that cone shape is too, um, too extreme, it might pop the sharp edges of that plunge lock 
uh, that's moving in and out with the spring, push it out if there's any force exerted on it. So I think getting it right, getting it perfect like this and, and cutting out a 90 degree walled socket uh, has just makes all the difference. Why is this thing snob proof? Well, because it's got it's got classic design lines. There's nothing you can say about this uh, knife uh, in terms of its classic lines. I mean, kind of look at it next to a Sabenza. Nowhere near the same. I mean, it is the same, but, uh, uh, you know, just very gentle ergonomic lines and an excellent action. And there's something about the dignity of having an excellent, excellent knife that is not a very expensive knife, but does the tool job right and has style and panache. And then that that third um, je ne sais quoi, that, that, oh, I don't know. It's just something about it I love. For me, it is fidgety. Uh, I love, love the way it feels in my hand and it carries nicely. And it's just something I keep going to. Four inch blade too, you can't go wrong. So CJRB Pyrite, I would say in any one of its forms are snob proof. Probably the most snob proof are those ones they're making with the contour titanium handles. Okay, next up, uh, the AD 20.5. So this is the, uh, the more readily available version of the AD 20 I was showing before. M much thinner, made in Taiwan, made with... Uh, more budget materials, in this case, OS 10. And uh, I'm sure this was made in one of the Taiwan factories that cold steels are made in. I'm sure the OS 10 is, uh, is beautifully heat treated. You can see the liners in there. Um, and this is one of the first ones that came out with that sort of um, gray, <laughs> that sort of uh, kind of boring putty gray, uh, but also kind of neat in a way because it's sort of tool-like. It doesn't... Uh, it's not too flashy, I guess. What what this really has that that makes it snob proof is the the pedigree, the Demco knives pedigree, and that amazing shark lock, which is easier for me to do with my right hand. But this amazing shark lock, this brought this lock into reach for people who don't have five hundred bucks to spend on one of these. So now suddenly. This was available. And now he's licensing it out to the likes of Flytanium, which I think is so cool. Uh, another thing that makes this knife um, <laughs> snob proof is its ugly blade. I'll say it. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think the shark's foot is an ugly blade. It is very useful. It is a very good blade, but not very eye friendly to me. Um, why did you get that one, Bob? Well, I don't know, because I guess I felt like I should, because I already have the clip point in the large version, but in retrospect, I think that was a silly choice. <laughs> uh, so one of these days I might haul off and get a, a, a more premium version of the 20.5, um, maybe in one of the titanium versions, or uh, this has been upgraded in many different ways since it first came out. But snob proof in its utility and then in its innovation for sure. And then let's let's face it, popularity that has a huge thing, huge part to do with it. Is it popular? Are the cool kids liking it? Are the popular knife guys liking this knife? And I'll be honest, if uh, if if Stasa or Jared likes something, uh, I definitely definitely pay attention because they actually use these things and really test them out, whereas I might not as much. Uh, that's why I call them our trusted voices. All right, next up is the Ritter Hogue RSK Mark I. In this case, uh, a mini RSK Mark I. Uh, so this is snob proof for many reasons. Let's let's start with pedigree. Uh, this is the new version or the updated version of the Benchmade Ritter Griptilian. So Doug Ritter, uh, the guy who started Knife Rights, uh, before he started Knife Rights, was a, a survival specialist and an aviation um, crash survival specialist. He used to make, or still does actually, uh, makes survival packs for aviators, uh, especially helicopter pilots. Uh, if they go down, uh, you know, in the bush, uh, different ways, uh, different materials in the survival kit to help uh, 
flyers in particular, pilots in particular. Uh, and when he was doing that, he when he first started that effort, he came upon the need for an inexpensive folding knife with an excellent steel. So he went to Benchmade. Benchmade OEM'd uh, his version of the Griptilian. They were all already making the Griptilian. They sort of took the handle from the Griptilian, which uh, followed his main stipulation of an inexpensive knife, inexpensive handle. But they upped the blade steel. I believe it was to S30V at that time and uh, put a different blade on it. This and this is the shape, a broader drop point blade with a higher flat grind. Um, so those Ritter Griptilians were always very coveted and hard to come by. And um, and then eventually uh, Benchmade stopped doing OEM work altogether. And Doug Ritter had to look for a new company to OEM his design. And boy, did he land on his feet with Hogue because Hogue has just taken it to the next level. They They lengthened the handle ever so slightly. Uh, have made it way more comfortable and uh, contoured it, put that sunburst pattern of grooves in there. So it's really grippy. Um, and their ABLE lock, which stands for um, ambidextrous bar lock enhanced, is their version of the axis lock and arguably a better lock. But at this point, I don't know if I can actually say that, but an awesome version of the axis lock. Only thing I don't like about this is the clip that comes with it. I put my, I put a, um, a uh, bug out clip on it. I like the small clip better. That's the one thing I don't like about Hogue knives are their clips, but that's neither here nor there. That's a taste issue. Uh, but this knife is also brag worthy and snob proof because every time you buy this exclusive from knife works, uh, the money goes to support Doug Ritter who spends all of his time and money fighting for our knife rights with knife rights. So this knife helps support the man that, so that has enhanced our knife rights in this country. As a matter of fact, in the last two years in my state of Virginia, um, Doug Ritter's efforts have helped A, make automatic knives not illegal in any capacity. And then this year, B, we can even now carry them concealed thanks to Doug Ritter. So, I mean, he does amazing work for us. And he also happened to have designed this extremely awesome uh, folder. So. Snob proof to the max is the is the RSK in any of its forms. Uh, I have the mini. This one was a gift from Doug Ritter himself, which was so cool. Um, and so I will never, ever get rid of this one. But I would love to get the big one again. I did have the full size one and gave that away. I would like to get another one. <laughs> but they come in a lot of cool colors now. I think you can get it in uh, orange and black like a Halloween one. And you can get it in flat, dark earth with black, different different versions, but you do have to go to knifeworks.com to get it. Uh, so a great way to help support the cause and to support a great guy and to have probably one of the best folders you will ever have in your pocket. All right, next up, <laughs> this is an odd one. Uh, this, this one always surprised me that it kind of took the knife world by storm. People that I didn't expect would like this, love this knife. And this is the mini version again, uh, this is the proponent from Artisan Cutlery and Dirk Pinkerton. Uh, Dirk Pinkerton, you know me, he's one of my absolute favorite designers and makers. I have a bunch of his custom, or I have like four of his customs and a bunch of his uh, production designs. He loves the Warncliffe and is a designer uh, of many a beautiful Warncliffe. So it's interesting to me that this is probably his most famous one. And it must be the audacity of the design. It might not come through in this mini version, but on the in the large four-inch bladed version, it would definitely come through. I mean, look at look at how chunky this is at three and a quarter inches uh blade length. Here, I'll put it next to the mini RSK. Look at that. I mean, it is a chunk. So that's what surprised me. People, especially in a time where people are kind of going back to more svelte knives, uh, it was amazing to me that this really caught on as it did. They're still coming out with different exclusives of this. As a matter of fact, uh, Knife Center just came out with a titanium frame lock version of this. Um, it just has long, long legs. And that's another part, like I mentioned before, um, with that Chinatown quote, that's another thing that... Um, that can make a knife like this uh, popular. It comes out 
people are interested in the novelty of such a big, chunky Warncliffe, they buy it and discover what an amazing tool it is. And then it goes from there. It becomes respectable, not just for being something interesting, like a giant Midgard's messer, but it's actually a great tool and not easy, not difficult to carry. Now this one, oof, uh, sorry about that. This one is 154 cm and uh, almost cut myself on it, 154 cm. And I thought when I got this, uh, this is a prototype. I got two of these from Dirk when he was kind of clearing out the, clearing out his collection of prototypes and stuff. Got this from him. I thought looking at it that it was going to be more wedge-like. But man, does this thing slice like a dream. And that tip is incredible. So this, this knife definitely has it on the tool side of the house too. It's not just an interesting, um, uh, audacious sort of conversation starter of a knife. It's also an outrageously excellent cutting tool. Next up, this list would be incomplete with you. I'm sure you've been spying it on the top of the screen, but yes, uh, it is the paramilitary too. I really labored over this choice. I was going to get an Endura um, because it's less expensive. Uh, and, and then, and I was looking at other uh, spider codes, but I just kept coming back to this and it's because it has the magic combination. First of all, it's got the pedigree. It is the PM2. It is the knife against which all other knives have been compared for years in YouTube videos, my, my own included. And I'm not sure how that started. Whoops, not so good with the left hand uh, reverse flick, but not sure how that started. But the PM2 became the standard. And um, it is a great knife. I have my little problems with it. There are reasons why I like the military better. Uh, my main problem with this knife is visual. Uh, it's probably my own problem, my only problem with this knife. It's that handle to blade ratio just has always irked me just a little bit. But now let's get over that sort of superficial thing and talk about the knife itself. It is an amazing, amazing tool. This one is in S30V. You can get it in pretty much any steel at this point and any sort of handle material you want or aftermarket or from them or an exclusive. Uh, but the handle itself is just amazing in this standard grip, standard sort of saber grip, just feels incredible. And then for utility and enhanced, uh, um, enhanced capability, you can come up here into that 50-50 choil and really go to town. You got a full flat ground leaf shaped blade with the, with the point, uh, center line or below. So utility all day long. It, if, if you hold the spine straight, it does have a sort of downward angled blade. Um, so just, an amazing knife and then it's got the like i said the history the pedigree it's it's been the most iterated i think of the col of the uh spider co's and then it's got this it's got the compression lock and the, this was the first knife featuring the compression lock which is a uh you know um a spider co original and i believe the patent on this is running out so we'll probably see more of them popping up here and there but uh you can't say anything bad about about the paramilitary too, even though I do just for fun. It's almost like, uh, you know, making fun of the 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 super alpha jock dude, like about his skinny calves, you know. Uh, and last up here, um, this is another Demco design. Uh, originally, it was a Demco um, <clears throat> custom, but Cold Steel. May, has been making such an exquisite version of this knife, which is extremely hard to get in the custom version, and that is the AD15. Uh, people love this AD15 uh, cold steel. People who were snobbish towards cold steel were won over when this came out. Um, really nice interpretation of the custom AD15. As a matter of fact, when I had uh, Andrew Demko on the show, um, episode. 118 or 20 i think it was 118 no no it was episode 20 uh when the shark lock was or when this scorpion lock was new he was talking about how uh cold steel did such a great um job copying his custom that it was almost uh it almost put the custom out of business for him he doesn't he doesn't make it anymore anyway because it's he can't but um 
selling this design to Cold Steel and having Cold Steel make it uh, really kind of was humbling for him because he because of what a great job they did. Humbling, but he was, you know, happy and everything that they did, uh, did justice to, to this great design. So uh, design wise, a snob can't say a thing because it's interesting. It's innovative. This is another one of Demco's innovations. That scorpion lock doesn't look like it should be comfortable, but it is. Uh, you can use the lock itself to open the knife. You can just stick your finger in there and widen it. Uh, you can flick it open. You, there's all sorts of ways to use this, uh, this lock. I've seen people do stuff. Uh, yeah, do it in reverse. I, don't, I almost was worried about doing that because I haven't practiced it. But um, And then you have this great flat ground blade. This is S35. Um, VN. They never did this in the XHP. This is from the very first run of them. Now you can get aftermarket scales. I've seen my car to aftermarket scales. I really like these G10 scales, though. I like that sort of diamond pattern. It looks sort of industrial to me. Um, and it's a it's also a snob proof cold steel. And that is hard to come by. Uh, snobs love to hate on cold steel. Knife snobs hate to hate to love on cold steel. Well, my knives are just tools and, you know, and uh, no Mokutai in cold steel. But uh, this is a design right here that you will be able to walk into any room and fully emasculate any knife snob that happens to reside there. The 8015 from Cold Steel. Thanks for coming uh, on this journey with me into snob proof knives, uh, those snob proof kings, and then the ones that won't break the bank. Uh, let me know what your suggestions are for snob proof knives. The Civivi Elementum at this point could be one. The Burnley Quaken could be one, even though I like to rag on how many versions there are. Uh, let me know. Leave it in the comments below. All right, be sure to join us on Sunday for a great interview. Uh, we have a great conversation. Uh, also, uh, make sure you join us on Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And uh, if you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by scanning the QR code right here on the screen or going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.